Professor David Carmen, who flew in from Sydney today to join us. Uh, Doreen Braitling, or Doreen Crook as she was, uh, was actually from England and she came to Australia in 1909, wasn't it Wally? As a, as a young girl with her mother Rose Crook, her, her, her sister Kathleen and her brother Sonny. And uh, they didn't come to Central Australia immediately, uh, but eventually they worked their way within a short time uh, on the train to Unadatta and then caught the buggy uh, up, which could take you two to three weeks in those days. So quite an adventurous trip for a, a young English family. Bill Crook, Doreen, or Dory as um, Wally told me she was actually known. Um, Bill Crook had come out a little bit earlier to try and find work. So it was quite an, a, an adventurous thing for this family to do. They uh, made their way to Glen Helen Station where Rose's uncle, Fred Raggett, and you all know Raggett Street in town, was running the station as well as owning a store in town at the corner of Parsons Street and Todd Street. They moved on to Hermansburg and eventually they worked their way into the telegraph station and uh, Rose was the station cook and Bill was the handyman. And uh, to get a picture of what life was like for them there, you only need to uh, read Alice on the Line, Doris, Doris Bradshaw's book, because the Bradshaws left in 1908. Uh, the, the crooks were there around 1911. So much the same sorts of experiences. Uh, young Doreen was in Mrs. Breitling's, uh, Mrs. Uh, Stanley's first class, which I think is interesting in that, as you know, school was held in the warder's hut to the side and when there were no prisoners they would often go inside the jail itself because it was obviously the coolest building in the town. So it's, it's interesting that uh, Doreen, who did time you could say as a school child in the jail, then has become recognised as the saviour of that jail later in the 70s when it was set to be bulldozed. Uh, and then if you follow a little bit of literature, uh, Bruce Plowman's book, The Man from Udnadatta, talks about the Crook family heading up the track in 1915 towards the Hatches Creek Wolfram Fields. And uh, this is the early days of the war and Wolfram was a mineral containing tungsten which was needed for toughening steel. So with the outbreak of war, Wolfram which had been found up that way by Alan Davidson's uh, expedition 1898-99 but had no great value, suddenly assumed a lot of value. And the Crook family were heading up towards the Hatches Creek Fields but in, they ended up actually at Wycliffe Well and they had the contract to uh, provide water for um, a travelling stock. And when you look at the conditions under which they lived, and Wally has shared some photos which are actually reproduced in the, uh, in the library at the moment, uh, if for no other reason other than the conditions under which this English family lived at Wycliffe Well, You'd, you'd say they are a truly remarkable little group of people for that reason alone. But we all know that in her later years, Doreen Crook, then Breitling, obviously took on, her life took on a whole new meaning which we're celebrating here tonight. In 1928, a drover came down the track and he's an interesting man himself. Bill Breitling had been moving cattle from Passchendaele Station, which was a property he'd acquired up near the VRD and uh, he was moving cattle down. But the second half of the 1920s was a very severe drought. In fact, it was the period when a lot of the native wildlife crashed in competition with rabbits and stock, obviously. And Bill was held up when he got to the Wycliffe Will area, and by that stage, uh, the, the, the Crook family had established a station. He met uh, Doreen. They were married in 1929. Wally was born in 1930, and I should at this stage actually say it's a thrill, Wally and Barb, to have you with us. I've really enjoyed getting to know Wally the last couple of years and chatting family history, and I'm going to embarrass him. Uh, because uh, you might like to pick this book up from the Alice collection. Don't take it with you, because they get very upset if you do that. But it's Cecil Madigan's book, Central Australia, which has got some great photos. And I just, there's a chapter about uh, Wally's mum, and uh, I love this photo which Wally actually referred to me a couple of weeks ago when we were chatting. And uh, here's seven-year-old Wally sitting in the sand and it's a nice photo with his hat on. I have a look at that and his mum as they were moving into town. And Wally said that his mother felt he needed education terms to know more than how to skin a lizard. And so Wally was coming into town to acquire an education and uh, 
Uh, it's been um, wonderful to get to know Wally's story as much as it is to get to know Doreen and his dad Bill's story. Uh, at that point, um, I'll stop because I don't want to take any of um, uh, David Carman's thunder. I'd just like to um, make a couple of quick thank yous uh, before we proceed uh, to the people who have supported us, the National Trust, in making a whole range of events possible, but particularly tonight. We do receive a, a significant grant to the Northern Territory Government. We also appreciate our other supporters like the Town Council in making this facility available. The support we've received from media, particularly ABC Radio and the Centralian Advocate. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Laurel Halford and Do It Yourself Tour Guides for the support of Heritage Week this week, and her time input has been significant. Um, Adam Giles, a uh, member for Breitling, helped us with promotion uh, of tonight's event. And most of all, I'd like to thank Professor David Carment. Um, David flew in this morning at his own expense which is a, an indication of two things, both his continuing ongoing interest in retirement in Northern Territory history, being a former professor of history at Charles Darwin University, previously NT University, uh, and also his support as a former president of the National Trust for this lecture, uh, which ran for a number of years and which we revived last year with the uh, John McDill Stewart 150th anniversary. It's a great pleasure to have David with us. He's published extensively on both Northern Territory and Australian history, as well as political history and politics. Uh, he's former president of the Australian Historical Association, the Historical Society of the Northern Territory, and of course I mentioned the National Trust. And in 2003, he was honoured being made a member of the Order of Australia for his involvement in community groups. Um, and uh, David, as we see the Doreen Breitling Memorial Lecture reborn and developing uh, a new momentum to take us into the years ahead. We really appreciate that uh, someone of your calibre has been prepared to, to join us here tonight in Alice Springs. So on that note, I'll hand over to David and look forward to uh, his lecture tonight. Well, first of all, Stuart, thank you very much for that kind introduction and that is terrific to be back in Alice Springs and already tonight I've um, met a number of old friends, people in some cases I first encountered in Alice Springs about 30 years ago. It's important, I think and appropriate on an occasion like this to acknowledge the traditional owners of Alice Springs, the Aboriginal people, the Arenta people who lived here for many thousands of years and I'm pleased to be able to do that. I must also thank the Madhur Stewart branch of the National Trust for inviting me to give tonight's lecture. I still clearly recall attend attending the Doreen Breitling lecture given by the aviation pioneer Eddie Connellan in 1982. It was a great occasion and there have been some fine lectures in the series since then. I hope that I might be able to live up to them. I always enjoy being in Central Australia. I've visited Alice Springs and other parts of Central Australia frequently over the last 30 years. It's a region not just of great beauty, but relevant to tonight with a fascinating heritage and history, a very special heritage and history. I, I never unfortunately met Dory Breitling as she died be two years before I came to live in the Northern Territory. Um, during my early years in the Territory, however, I heard much about it from my friends Tom Fleming and Hilda Tuxworth, who remembered her well and enormously admired her. A pioneer and pastoralist in Central Australia, as we've already heard, she moved to Alice Springs to live following her husband's Bill's death in 1959. Although by this time frail and physically worn out as the result of the hardship she had experienced, she became actively involved in community affairs. As I'm sure just about everyone here knows, she was a founder of the National Trust in the Territory, <coughs> led the successful battle to save the Stuart Town Jail from destruction, and served as the first president of the National Trust of Australia and Northern Territory that was established by legislation in 1976. She was a woman of courage, foresight and great tenacity. As most members of the audience tonight would also be aware, the National Trust in the Territory existed long before the 1976 legislation and was started here in Alice Springs 
in 1958. I want to explain tonight how its foundation should be seen in the much wider context of individuals such as Doreen Brakeling and her friends during the 1950s participating in a movement that at least in some respects led the way for the rest of Australia. Its focus was on the material evidence of the past, what we now call cultural heritage, especially objects built by humans to cope with their physical environments and express their individuality. While community awareness of cultural heritage in Australia first became very noticeable during the 1960s and the 1970s, it existed long before then. Certainly during the 1950s, there was evidence of how attached Indigenous and some non-Indigenous Australians were to the land where they lived. It was during this time that the National Trust movement and local historical societies in Australia steadily developed. There was increasing interest in historic places and objects. In comparison with the period since the 1960s, though, the interest was limited. There were, as yet, very few mechanisms to protect places of heritage significance. There were also tensions among those Australians who were interested in the past. As Tom Griffiths, a historian, argues, the most obvious of these were between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians and between amateurs and professionals. The Northern Territory historian Alan Powell identifies what he calls as the heritage of Territorians in various ways, and I quote him, in isolation from the rest of the continent, nearness to Asia, war experience, location in the tropics, and the powerful influence of the Aborigines. Above all, it is the long colonial experience that sets them most apart. Physical reminders of Central Australia's past during the 1950s were many and diverse, yet I think at least they reflected the themes that Powell outlines. They included rock art sites and places inhabited by Aboriginal people in the past, and a variety of remains from the 1860s onwards associated with land exploration, transport and communications, agriculture and pastoralism, race relations and war. In common with the rest of Australia, places of historic importance in Central Australia were frequently poorly managed and protected. The conservation and management of the region's cultural heritage was not a particularly important object for the Commonwealth administrators who looked after the Northern Territory. Yet, changes were occurring. As I've already noted, a National Trust was established, and as I'll be explaining in more detail later, the Northern Territory's Legislative Council passed an ordinance that was designed to protect certain significant places, areas and objects. Increasing attention, particularly by anthropologists and archaeologists, was being directed to the cultural heritage of Indigenous Central Australians. Monuments and memorials were erected to prominent non-Indigenous historic figures. Parks and reserves were established to help protect culturally significant places what later on became known as cultural heritage tourism started to have an impact in Central Australia. It is impossible to consider awareness of cultural heritage in Central Australia during the 1950s without highlighting some quite stark differences between the region and the territory's top end. Non-Indigenous residents of Alice Springs and Central Australia appeared to have more time to consider their histories and the need to preserve places and objects. They were generally keen to develop the local tourist industry. They were very acutely aware of being pioneers 
on the frontier of what they regarded as civilization.